everyone, and welcome to Functional Fertility, the podcast designed to demystify your hormones, up-level your lifestyle, and supercharge your fertility potential. Quite frankly, I always say, if you're not doing something to love your gut on a regular basis, it probably needs some support. I'm your host, Dr. Kalia Waddles, and today we're unpacking the impact of stress on fertility and giving you some nutritional hot takes with our guest, functional fertility dietitian, Olivia Mitchell. Olivia is an expert in women's health and fertility. She's trained in functional nutrition, which dives deep into what's really often overlooked causes of infertility. She provides customized diet, lifestyle, supplement changes in order to help couples everywhere get pregnant naturally or increase their success in IVF. She's passionate about getting couples better answers and helps to take the stress out of fertility challenges while promoting better health in both partners for their future family. Just a great colleague. I always enjoy chatting with her so much. Welcome to the show, Olivia. Thank you, Kalia. It's awesome to be here. I'm pretty psyched about everything we got coming up. Yeah, we have so many synchronicities in the things that we like to learn about and like to talk about. So I think this is going to be such an an excellent episode. And I I have to start out a little casual here because I think we're both enjoying some fairly medicinal beverages. So maybe this will be a new tradition on the Functional Fertility Podcast. Tell us what you're drinking this morning. (laughs) I love it. And I love just mixing it up with beverages because it can get so boring with water, right? So I'm happy to share just a simple little thing. It's just some flavored electrolyte powder. I like orange and then some trace mineral drops, which the orange kind of hides the flavor of the very bitter, bitter trace mineral drops if you ever had those. So yeah, just that's it. And just a little flavor. Great. We're synced. I'm also drinking some orange electrolytes this morning. So I love everybody, it. as you're listening right now, go get your hydration for the rest of the episode, and then you'll be very well prepared to soak in all this knowledge we're about to talk about. So uh, this is actually the perfect segue to talk about stress because there's definitely mm-hmm. some mineral and electrolyte components to how our body deals with stress. But I'm so excited that this is our topic for today, because I think we hear, we we can all accept, oh, stress has an impact on fertility. But when we talk about that, I I think it's often received as, oh, um, you know, my job is really hard Mm -hmm. and financial stress and running around all the time in like hustle culture. But stress can really mean so many things and there's so many nuances and once we start diving into those conversations and helping patients understand what their sources of stress are it's so enlightening and sometimes shocking i think like, oh gosh i didn't even realize my body was perceiving my really irregular bedtime as stress right so this is a big conversation what are some of the ways that you approach this conversation with patients, what are the most common stressors you see in your population who's really trying to get pregnant? Yeah, this is something that I think needs broken down because like you said, Clea, it's so easy to just say, well, well, yeah, I'm stressed. Life is stressful. Like all those things you mentioned and they seem uncontrollable, right? It's like, well, what am I supposed to quit my job and like, you know, go on vacation every week? Obviously that would be lovely, but we can't all be doing that. And so we do have to, I I find by having this conversation first, it really breaks down that seemingly uncontrollable part of a fertility journey and brings some control into the equation. And so when we realize, like you said, even simple lifestyle things like not sleeping enough or maybe over exercising for our body's needs, which is a huge one that I see. I mean, who thinks of exercise as a potential negative, right? exercises uh, world, you know, just always this great thing. However, we can be doing too much, especially when it comes to females and fertility and our hormones needed to support the best fertility possible. So that is a super common one. And oftentimes I really, um, working with, with couples and again, women in particular on this, I recommend, Hey, let's for, especially those women who are hardcore cardio. That's my relaxation. That's my de-stress, right? We actually oftentimes feel that cardio is our de-stressor after that work, hard work day and long time sitting in front of the computer. But in reality, that can actually keep us in that stress mode. So I like to point out, hey, let's just bring in a couple different things, maybe something like simple taking a walk outside, 
that could be a huge game changer for someone. Even just a few times a week swapping out their cardio, you don't have to stop it all together. But what that does and, and other activities, something like yoga or um, even just having, I mean, being intimate with our partners often is a, a fantastic uh, low, low cardio um, exercise that I recommend for people. But what happens is not only do we get connection with those things, with nature, with our partners, with our body, is we let our body come out of that stressful state that we've likely been in all day long instead of continuing that stressful state on the electrical for another hour or, you know, out running for another hour on hard pavement. So just that example is a good one to start off with of really kind of showing the difference of let's move out of this stress state or uh, our sympathetic state and into our peace state or parasympathetic state with the different activity. So that's a huge one. Um, I mean, like really, really right off the bat, that one, especially if it's paired with other things, for example, under eating. Right. If we're not eating enough because of our busy days and we run out the door and don't really have time for breakfast, maybe we're fueling on coffee till lunchtime, um, then over ever exercising plus under eating, your body is thinking, whoa, I don't really have a lot of extra here to spare. Right. I'm kind of running on empty. And really, when we're talking fertility and women's and, and both uh, male and female fertility, we need a good we need our body to feel safe. We need resources. Our body's got to have a lot of resources on board to produce the hormones we need to uh, get pregnant, stay pregnant, have great pregnancies. And that is where just that we want to think of energy, right? Do we have enough energy? And does our body think we have enough energy? So that's a huge part of it. Um, on top of, right, emotional stressors. And let's be real, trying to conceive is a big stressor, Right. We can't forget about that on top of everything we're talking about. So we do have to really think of, okay, yes, we can't control some of these things. And yes, it is oftentimes stressful when we're trying to conceive. So let's really see, make sure our bodies are feeling nourished. Make sure we're eating enough. We're fueling our tank. We're bringing in more than we're putting out. And, and then really the last part of this is physiological stressors, or we could think of these as internal stressors. So these are things that we may have no clue that are kind of going on underneath the surface, like inflammation, hormone imbalances, thyroid, uh, maybe just our, a slightly under-functioning or suboptimal thyroid, silent gut problems, and even adrenal issues. So, you know, these are things that not only, you know, we may not be feeling them or we may feel them, but we just kind of have chalked up the symptoms as being our normal, like how we normally feel, right? So we don't oftentimes think of those as stressors. So even right there, you can see that there's so much that we can do and improve and not just fall into this, well, of course I'm stressed. <laughs> Life is stressful. What are you going to do about it? Type of narrative. Yeah. Oh, that was so, so much to chew on there. I have so many points that we'll have to go back and touch on. But but the, the first part I want to go back to is I love how you framed this as you know, there's some, some aspects of this modifiable lifestyle behaviors that mm -hmm. we can act on right away. So when things feel out of control and you feel like I've done everything and I've asked all the questions, well, let's just really return and dive into that lifestyle piece because that's where we can actually see the greatest impact for, you know, you didn't necessarily need to spend any money to adjust your mm -hmm. bedtime or to change the time of the day that you do your cardio or to shift your eating windows. Those are all things that you can just do. And so I think that's the first part I, I want to go back, talk about. The next thing I want to highlight is um, in your education that you provide, I see you talk about nervous system dysregulation. And that really plays into this safety piece when you were talking about having an energy balance that's favorable for reproduction. When we look at the research of things like energy balance and adequate sleep, these things that as you said, make the nervous system feel safe. They actually call it predation risk. Like that's how our nervous system perceives these yeah. things is, are we about to be eaten by a dinosaur or, or not? And so making sure that our nervous system doesn't sense this predation risk all the time is so important for hormone production to maintain a pregnancy. So how do you identify the type of patient that has nervous system dysfunction? Is there a way that they present? Are there symptoms they're experiencing? What type of person 
elevates this on your radar, like, gosh, we really need to dive in and do some stress transformation strategies around here. Yeah. And I think this is such an important piece because we don't, and I think I can speak to this personally because I am and definitely was more of this person as we, well. We so, all are uh, right. deeply related. <laughs> Absolutely. So, you know, that we want to, when we think of this person that might have nervous system dysregulation, and, and as you mentioned, we're kind of, um, our bodies feel like we're just kind of always fighting for survival, basically, yeah. but yeah. it's modern threats like Instagram and our finances and our stresses about getting, you know, the family and a job stuff, all these things keep our body locked in that state. So when I'm, when I first uh, am, am speaking with someone or, or wondering if this is a potential consideration to help their fertility, we're thinking of the type of person that just is always on the go, not really comfortable relaxing, right? That person who can't sit still or always needs to be doing something. Oftentimes it can be accompanied with sleep issues, troubles, falling asleep or staying asleep. When we're talking about um, nervous system, we're also thinking even the way that our hormones are presenting. So this may be period problems in women. We could be having long, short periods, painful periods, non-existent periods, or really kind of random um, ovulation. And so, I mean, there are physical manifestations. Our body's really showing us these things. And then there are also kind of some... I want to say personality or even just like lifestyle factors that we also want to consider, not that our personality is driving fertility issues. However, when your body is driving those personality things like that inability to relax or, you know, always needing to stay busy, always feeling like the other shoe is going to drop. Maybe you're a type of person who makes mountains out of molehills, kind of always on that high level of, you know, perceived stress then we want to dive deeper and look at those symptoms. We want to dive deeper and look at labs. We want to dive deeper and really see the story that your body and your hormones are telling that actually could be contributing to these personality traits, which is a kind of, you know, way to flip flop it because we're thinking, well, yeah, that's just me. That's who I am, right? Like I'm type A, I'm perfectionist. I'm a go-getter. That's made a lot of people very successful in their lives, right? And so we don't want to necessarily come at that, but we want to think, what what is our body, how is our body actually handling all of this? And is it actually kind of keeping us in that state when maybe we no longer need to be or it's no longer serving us? And so that's a big thing that I like to um, kind of uncover with 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 people. Yeah, well, let's dive into this. One of my mentors says that when you have a hormonal imbalance, it's really an appropriate response to an abnormal situation in the context of your life. So yeah. if you have elevated cortisol, oftentimes that is an appropriate response to what's going on with your your circadian rhythm, your stre- your level of perceived stress, your nutrition, your body is trying to help you by saying, okay, let me give you some extra cortisol so that you can be with it and you can react and you can be energized. So I think that that's really important that there's a bi-directional communication. Our hormones kind of influence our lifestyle and our lifestyle influences our hormones. So great point there. Yeah. And that's other, you know, other systems in the body, right? Our thyroid, our gut, all of these are going to respond appropriately to that environment. Right. And so oftentimes I said, we need to thank our bodies, quite frankly. And I know that can sound strange, but let's thank our bodies for getting us through those stressors. Right. And helping us and and really uh, responding how they needed to. But we also need to maybe say thank you, but we're going to we can handle this better going forward or we can handle this differently going forward with the tools that we're not learning. Find a little bit more balance in this Mm -hmm. path forward. Olivia, you talked about inflammation as one source of stress that just might not be as intuitive. I, once you kind of learn what inflammation might look like with water retention and joint pain, I mean, I think those are more obvious signs, but there can be very subtle signs of inflammation in the body. So this is an area where I really go looking for labs Mm-hmm. What are some of the most common sources of inflammation that you find in your fertility patients? 
Inflammation is quite sneaky, right? It is, it's very hard. Yeah, it, and it's one of those things where, as you may, like, we may not feel, right? Or if we feel it, we don't know that that's what it is. And so common sources or stems of these inflammatory processes that I find are really beginning in either some gut dysbiosis. Yes. So imbalanced gut bacteria, which quite frankly, I always say, if you're not doing something to love your gut on a regular basis, it probably needs some support, right? Like there's so many things in our life that affect our gut that if we're not actively working on it, then, you know, it, and that could be very simple things that we could talk about, but if we're not actively loving it, gut is likely a place that we need to dive into. Other areas include blood sugar imbalance, which is a yes. huge one. You're like, yeah, that's, that's huge. And blood sugar imbalance is so common. And, and, and again, it can present in different ways in different people. Um, oftentimes we think blood sugar, insulin, then we kind of think of diabetes, overweight, right? Yes, we, we could have that energy balance issue and have high insulin causing inflammation, especially in the ovaries, but also low blood sugar. Right. So in that person that we're kind of talking about, maybe running out the door quickly for without having a protein rich breakfast, maybe just fueling up on a second coffee because they need that bridge between, you know, the morning and the afternoon. And our blood sugar is often dropping low. And subsequently, it is it's likely coming high in times as well. High cortisol also impacts our blood sugar. So those things really are huge, huge uh, root causes that I often dive into as people, among others, things like vitamin and mineral deficiencies, general things that we're eating causing inflammation, right? Inflammatory foods, which is just, it's, it's all over. Um, and so those are some very common and oftentimes what I say, like low hanging fruit, but that are so impactful to dive into, do a quick reframe, and really see the difference that your body uh, can do with, with making those swaps. And one thing, actually, I just um, kind of learned more about this the other day in some of my continuing education. And I'm sure you're well aware, uh, Kalia, because you're so familiar with inflammation and mitochondrial health and ovarian function. But the I found it so fascinating that the oocytes in the egg actually contain the highest number of mitochondria of any cell in the body. And I was just like, oh my, it makes, you know, the more you learn in this, field, it, everything does connect and it comes back to everything that we're talking here. But it was just a huge light bulb moment for me, like, oh my gosh. And that is why all of this stuff is so powerful, right? So that's what I like that. If, if you take any pearl away from this, like inflammation is going to have a big impact on those, on the, the, the actual egg that you're going to ovulate and hopefully become pregnant with. Yeah. Yeah. We could, I mean, inflammation, inflammology could be a whole study of medicine. I mean, this is a really, really important for fertility. I absolutely agree. The gut is a huge source mm -hmm. of inflammation, whether that's intestinal hyperpermeability or we're eating foods that we're sensitive to the dysbiosis. I mean, they, they don't say health begins in the gut for no reason. That is, there's absolutely truth there. And then actually just thinking about the entire tube of our digestive and assimilation systems in looking in the mouth, periodontal mm. disease I see as a huge contributor to, to inflammation. I always do a gum exam with my fertility patients and they say, what are you doing? Why does this matter? But we know that gum inflammation can significantly impact a systemic inflammation. And, um, you know, we, as you mentioned, we see inflammation extending into the ovaries. We see it extending into the endometrium. If you're a sperm producer, we see testicular inflammation that really impacts sperm production. Um, so inflammation is such a big deal. And of course, I love that you brought up mitochondrial health because that's my most favorite topic in the whole world. And I just have to put a, a teaser out there. I just, I just did a, a lecture at another conference about ovarian aging and reproductive longevity. Mm -hmm. And inflammation is such a significant driver of aging in our reproductive system because of the way that it affects the ovarian tissue itself. It causes atrophy or a wasting away of that ovarian tissue. And we see this accelerated aging. And I think this is really relevant to the conversation we're having about, you know, stress and, and that hustle culture and perfectionism I think so many of my contemporaries, you know, people I went to medical school with and my friends all feel this sense of pressure to 
perform and have it all and have the job and the family and the money. And what is that doing? Even just this, the emotional stress of that causing this inflammation to our ovarian longevity, when we're trying to, you know, push our fertility later and later, we want to have a baby when we're 40, but we've spent the last 20 years in inflammation overdrive because we're so worried. And so all of this to say, this is why I think this, this education is so important because if I would have heard this when I was 20 or 25, I would have made some different choices. I would have, even with my lifestyle, I would have done some things differently. Yep. Yep. It is very powerful. And again, just to switch that narrative to kind of feeling a little bit more of, Hey, what can we actually do to improve this? And it might take a little bit of time. However, when we consider in the long run, you know, kind of the path that we're running and, and this path, to possible burnout all because of what, like you mentioned, you know, all these things that we want to accumulate, then what's really most important, right? And not that we have to choose, or we can only do one, but really considering how we can preserve and really address this inflammation as we live our busy, productive lives and really have better outcomes in, you know, if, we're, if we want to start a family later or we're continuing our families or however we want to really think about that fertility picture. And, and this is, uh, my husband and I were actually talking about this on a drive the other day too, just about like how stress, again, this idea of stress, right? It's so all encompassing is so different now with all the things that you just mentioned, right? All of these you know, uh, striving to have more and do more in, in our careers and everything, which is wonderful, but how different it is from a primal source of stress, right? Like our primal examples of stress back whenever you're talking about, you know, okay, our stress is actually eat, getting eaten by a predator, right? Like we're worried about getting eaten by a predator, which is obviously a major stress, but it shuts off, right? We, when we're out of that danger, our stress system shuts off. We are maybe, you know, short on food for a period of time. But when we find food, when our tribe comes across food, that stress system shuts off. Now it's like, it's just, it's never off, right? It's just, there's always something. And so it's, it's really, um, I just wish I could have, you know, actually see the, the side-by-side -side comparison there, but just to think about it is, is quite interesting. That is a very good visual. I'm going to be thinking about that later. I, I think it's helpful to give listeners some takeaways because it, we talk about these things and then everybody is feeling like, okay, well, how do I know if I have something going on in my gut? And how do I know if I have something going on with inflammation? So maybe I'll share a couple of pieces of how I measure this. We'll see if your approach is the same. Um, I love I love to do some gut testing. So a comprehensive mm -hmm. stool analysis looks at all kinds of things. It looks at if there's dysbiosis, it looks at inflammatory markers in the gut. Uh, we can see if there's, you know, some parasitic infection in the gut, which is helpful to know. And then in terms of just standard blood work, I order a test that's called HSCRP, a high sensitivity C-reactive protein. This is super standard. Any lab, any lab has this available. So I order this. Um, this is a, a, a marker of inflammation and something that I like to track as I'm treating inflammation. It really helps me understand how I'm impacting the inflammatory burden. So if anybody has that and they're on their labs, um, the reference range goes up to three. I like to see it below one. These are accessible tools that we have to kind of make some, some judgments about what's going on in the gut with inflammation. Are there some things that you're doing too, that are in addition to those or same? Yeah. I mean, Tests don't guess always. I, I love testing. Um, stool testing in this particular case, case obviously is fantastic. If you're not able to do testing, I mean, even the kind of fail safe, just going and doing some gut healing protocols, like a 4R gut healing protocol, or even just increasing your fermented foods, your fiber in your diet, right? Those are things that we can really be doing uh, things like colorful foods, colorful foods, fruits and vegetables, having uh, my goal is to each meal, right? Uh, on most meals, again, no, no need for perfection here. But even just bringing in more, I often find is a very helpful thing for people to begin with and bringing in more of those healing foods. And, and even um, if you're able to talk with a functional medicine practitioner that kind of takes the, the hyper focus away from the reproductive system and looks at systems like the gut and mm -hmm. the adrenals and the thyroid, then they can also help you understand what prior exposures. Maybe um, you were on antibiotics a lot as a kid for a lot of your infections. 
Maybe you have been on certain medications that are going to affect your gut. Again, general stress burden, um, drinking a lot of acidic foods or a lot of alcohol, um, certain uh, fam familial history, right? All of this can help a trained practitioner to just say, hey, you know, like, test or no test, we got to do some work here, right? And these are things that we can do. So building up your gut's overall health and resiliency, things like ch short chain fatty acids. One of my favorites is ghee for this, right? Oh, Cooking with more ghee. ghee. It's so delicious and such a good little uh, addition, right? To other good healthy fats in our kitchen. But little things, and remember the power really is in these small changes. So again, I mean, testing, absolutely test, don't guess. However, if you're unable to do that, or you just don't, not right now, it isn't the time for you, then making these small changes, I think that's, and, and you said this really well earlier, Cleo, is, you know, these are often overlooked, right? I mean, now it's in my bio too, right? Like helping with often overlooked yes. obstacles. And I think that's what people kind of take for that's why it's taken for granted right like well does that really matter right like I've been trying for a year and I've done all these tests and I've done maybe even an IVF really changing my diet is going to help yeah like yeah. that's that's why it's so powerful and so not overlooking those things is is really a key to the grand picture here too yeah this overlooked piece I hear this all the time I've done everything I've done mm -hmm. every test I've done every change. And then I say, okay, well, let's talk about your inflammation. Then what, what, have, what's happening there? And it's like, oh, I've never thought about that before. Okay. Here's a path. Let's turn over this stone, see what's under there. And oftentimes I see inflammation in, in my patients who have unexplained infertility, right? Because of the way it can impact ovulation and endometrial receptivity. That's another piece because of the way that, that inflammation can impact the endometrium, that inner line, inner lining of the uterus. We see patients who maybe they are ovulating. They say, my progesterone looks good every month I'm ovulating. And maybe they're even fertilizing, but it doesn't have a healthy endometrium in which to implant. So we absolutely have to look at inflammation a little bit. And you're absolutely right. Almost everyone, uh, me and you, we know all the things and we could probably even do some more intentional anti-inflammatory changes. We all have something that we could do. Yeah. And this is so that, you know, whenever someone maybe comes in and they're talking about their nutrition or diet and like, well, I, I eat healthy already. Like, wonderful. I'm so happy to hear that, but let's, figure out what healthy is for you, right? Let's figure out what we actually need to bring in for your healthy diet. Because unless we're understanding more about what are our personal stressors, what is our inflammation, possibly looking at the sources of inflammation in our body, right? What are our specific nutrient deficiencies? We can't find that online, right? We can't just like Google a diet and, and or do what our best friend did and be hitting all those needs. So it, there is a level to it where we do have to be open to the fact of I'm eating well already. I'm, I'm aware and, and I, I, I enjoy making healthy choices, but there's so much more that I can learn and implement and improve and benefit from. Yeah. Going towards the source of the inflammation in the gut, I often see food sensitivities are mm. happening and, you know, testing is, has some controversies for a couple of different reasons. And sometimes it's expensive and it's just not appropriate for every person. So I am an absolutely devoted fan of a comprehensive elimination diet in someone who I suspect there's food sensitivities going on. And I've actually seen an elimination diet alone drop a high sensitivity C-reactive protein pretty significantly because we're, we're removing these inflammatory foods and we're kind of shifting our focus into produce, fresh foods, eating the rainbow, like you're saying. So I, I'm just such a believer. I actually, we, we run elimination diets in our office among staff just for fun every year. And somebody usually gets pregnant. Like they weren't, that's not exactly what they were trying to happen, but because their body go, goes through this shift, all of a sudden they're more fertile. Um, and I use it with fertility patients all the time with great success. Is this something you're using in your practice? I know not everyone loves the elimination diet, but I'm such a fan. What, what, what's your, your hot take on elimination diet? Yeah, the elimination diet is still, I think that gold standard, as you mentioned, and we do often use it. However, I am very aware of certain individuals who have come in who maybe have been under eating or have yes. a history of, of uh, disordered or 
um, disordered eating. And so oftentimes that's a type of client that I will get. And I don't want to put them on an elimination diet right away because that can bring back some of those negative yes. associations with food. Mm -hmm. And kind of, again, going back to our first topic, of stress, right? Bring in a stress of under eating and under fueling. So I do, I'm very selective about who I begin it with or when I begin it with, with a certain person. Uh, but we do oftentimes variations of it, right? So that four R protocol really, uh, instead of the first step is often remove the first R is remove certain foods. I do a reduce, right? So let's reduce certain foods and bring in and then um, kind of bring in other foods in their place. I'm always trying to come out bringing in more things than taking out, uh, especially in that particular client that needs that little bit more of a, a of that surplus picture than a taking away picture. Yeah, super healthy approach, realistic, approachable, reasonable. I, there's so many nutrition strategies that we could talk about for uh, lowering inflammation and supporting our body's nutrient capacity. I'll just give one more kind of strategy, a shout out. I love a Mediterranean diet. There's so much research in terms of fertility for both men and women. So if, if somebody's feeling like, you know, I think my diet's pretty healthy already, mm -hmm. I might just explore a Mediterranean style that really focuses on the fat and the fiber and the B vitamins. Is that something you're recommending often as well? Great foundational diet right there. Absolutely. And bringing in more colors. That's something that the Mediterranean diet does as well, not just in fruits and vegetables, but spices. So we yes. know that spices and herbs have a really powerful anti-inflammatory effect on the body. And so that's something as well, even if someone's coming in with like a pretty darn good diet, it's like, okay, we can usually always add in more of those therapeutic spices um, and herbs into our cooking, whether dry or fresh, bring in that color, bring in those antioxidants. And that's something as well that I love about a Mediterranean diet, um, bringing in that really anti-inflammatory foundation. I oftentimes do a combo of uh, more like, not that I like to get caught up on labels, but more of a paleo based and Mediterranean as well, depending on where someone's starting, um, kind of bringing in a little bit more of that dropping possible triggering foods like gluten and dairy, if they're not at a point where doing a food sensitivity test is appropriate. And then bringing those in and reintroducing those in a really upgraded way can be just really round out that idea of that anti-inflammatory whole foods, good quality fat diet. And um, oftentimes it's much more satiating for people. You probably find this all the time too, but they're like, sometimes when they start, they can't even finish the food on their plate that we have in a, a given meal plan for them. And, and that's okay that, you know, we don't want to uh, overshoot that or push that. However, many months in, they are able to enjoy that food and really feel so much more energy, have, you know, relief in some of their symptoms, but they're eating more, but it's more nutrient dense food, more anti-inflammatory food. And they're getting so much more. I mean, I just can picture, you know, I try to envision just like, than just soaking up all this goodness from, uh, from the, the food. And, and so I love whenever that's the case. Absolutely love when that's the case. Yeah. I love that you brought in the spice component because um, spices and herbs, I think are underappreciated in terms of their medicinal value. And when we're looking for food variety, sometimes we'll do little challenges with patients and say, okay, let's eat 10 different types of plants or some for the more advanced, let's eat 50 different types of foods this week and herbs and spices absolutely count. So I love that you brought that up. It's also interesting. All this talk about, you know, the fat and the fiber, what I should have told you all earlier, because it's so fun is I'm wearing a continuous glucose monitor right now. So I'm watching how my blood sugar is reacting to foods in real time. But even more interestingly, I'm watching how my mood is impacted by those peaks and valleys in my blood yeah. sugar. And uh, you can absolutely tell. I mean, I think when uh, I used to be hangry, I would, you know, be snappy and be irritated and feel like hot and flushed and almost like I was getting sick. And now I'm able to say, oh, my blood sugar is really low right now. And so once we start to make those connections, we're so empowered to uh, maybe not, I, I, 
I have this whole thing of like, I'm an anxious person, but I think I, I am an anxious person. That is true. But also I think sometimes that's exacerbated by these fluctuations in blood sugar. And we can manage that with nutrition, with all of these strategies that you've mentioned, even beyond nutrition. I know you practice some other stress relieving techniques. I've seen you teach about some breathing techniques. Will you just talk us through some of your favorite stress relieving strategies outside of the realm of nutrition? Yeah, absolutely. And this is, again, something really important to remember because it's not just about one thing. It's not just about the food. It's not just about the perfect supplement regimen. It's not just about the, so bringing in a little bit of each of these is really what I found to be the most helpful for people and, and the most realistic. And yeah, one of my favorites is breath, right? Our breath is the remote control of our nervous system. And so when we just even understand that, we're able to understand, oh, okay. So from what I've learned today, if I'm breathing better, then I'm able, actually able to nourish that, that um, parasympathetic state, which is the peaceful state. And if you're like me, I always got these confused. I always remember sympathetic stress, SS, parasympathetic peace, P and P. So it kind of helps you to, to kind of um, envision that when we're talking. And so, yeah, we're bodies got to be in this parasympathetic state, which I call welcome baby mode in my program. And so when we breathe, we can actually, even when we're in a stressful situation, we're at work, our boss is yelling at us. I don't know. We're in a, a fight with our, our partner. Um, we come out of that afterwards. We just want to breathe. And it sounds silly because of course you're breathing already, right? However, we want to be breathing in a way that really helps our body to come out of that stressful state. And I call this belly breathing. Well, it's called belly breathing. I didn't name it. Belly breathing. What we do is just breathe in through our mouth and you feel your belly expand. So you can actually put your hands. I love putting my hands right on my belly or even lower abdominal region, right? Thinking of your womb area. You put your hands on your belly, breathe in for three to five seconds, feel your belly expand and then breathe out and feel your belly come back towards your spine and consciously breathing in this way, right? Belly breathing. It's called diaphragmatic breathing, whatever we want to call it. If we just think of our regular day to day, how many times are we actually deep breathing like that, right? Probably not a lot. Most of us are really poor breathers. We're slouched over our computer. We are inhaling really shallow. We're not really getting that exchange of air and gases like we need to like CO2. And so just by doing that three times in a day, right? Even, you know, three minutes, three times, whatever you can do is a huge improvement for sending a different message. And this is where I think it's really powerful, sending a different message from that stress coming into your brain and what that brain sends to your body, your ovaries, your fertility, your hormones, right? Because stress will always be there. Stress, there's no getting rid of it. We are going to feel that, we're going to see, it, we're going to perceive it in our brain. But what we can do is change that message that it sends our fertility just by breathing. One of the most powerful things I think in this, and 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 as again, as coming as a classically trained dietitian, if you would have told me this in my you know undergrad or my early years, I'd be like, what? That doesn't matter. I, come on, food, 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 right? It's you got to have the perfect diet. It, you got to we got to again pull that hyper focus away. Think about what else is stressing your body. That's huge. The next one I would say is. Again, we kind of touched on it earlier. If your go-to stress relief is cardio, you might want to think about switching it up. Not that you can't do cardio, right? Mm -hmm. But try taking a walk, especially out in nature. Do some breathing out in nature, right? Instead of in the gym. Um, walk on uneven surfaces. Kind of get a different, do some yoga. Do a little different um, activity and exercise. And this was, again, just kind of drawing it back to a personal experience. I know I like, I grew up as an athlete, you know, high school, doing all the things, college. And so it's very difficult for me as a, an adult, you know, outside of college in the work field, thinking that exercise was something other than sweating really hard, right? Being out of breath, sweat dripping down, right? Like I thought exercise equals that pain that, you know, that stress, right? That, that picture of, I, I am, I'm depleted. I'm burnt out. Like I did a hard workout. Yay me. So going for a walk, I was like, man, I don't know. Is this really enough? Right. <laughs> and so I think that's again, thinking of that, but what is really serving your body and coming from someone that has and had, 
even more adrenal issues. Um, that was a big one for me. And then the last one I would say is sleep. Huge, huge, huge. It's like, I mean, I know you're huge. You always talk about this, Galea, which is so important because again, it's overlooked in this sleep when you're dead hustle culture. However, if you're not sleeping, you're not repairing. Um, sleep is so, so important for, I know, testosterone production in men, sperm production in men, cleaning up, preparing the body, lowering inflammation. If we're waking up stressed already, you know, within five minutes of our day, we got to think about how are we really treating this sleep hygiene picture. And so I would say those are some really key areas that we can think of when we want to implement stress relieving techniques. And everything you mentioned is so accessible, right? We can breathe. We can drop everything we're doing and breathe at any point. We can change our bedtime routine to be more regular. We can do, I call them restorative practices, the yoga and the Tai Chi and the Qigong or whatever is fits into your preferences the most. Okay. Olivia, as we're drawing to the end of the episode, we've learned so much. And now I'm going to put a little fun twist on things because I know you love nutrition so much. Here's my question. I didn't tell you I was going to ask you this. So it's, you're really on the spot. If you had to eat one food every day for the rest of your life, you didn't have to eat it exclusively, but you had to eat some of it every day forever. What are you going to choose? Easy. Butter. Oh, it's easy. It's butter? Yep. I mean, that's a great choice. I love I butter. Can't, I can't give it up. I can't. I think butter would be, I would be a much sadder person if I didn't have butter in my day to day. So that, yeah, butter and eggs are a close second, but butter. Wow. I'm right there with you. I love both butter and eggs and butter and eggs together is just really the dream combination. <laughs> so Exactly. Oh, Olivia, it's been such a pleasure chatting with you today. This is so fun. We could go on for hours. I just so appreciate you sharing your insights with our audience. Thank you so much for having me on, Clea. Yeah, I feel if we met for coffee, we would shut the place down. So <laughs> I'm Absolutely. glad we have a time limit on here for, for our listeners' sake. We'll so appreciate your time. To all of our listeners, we always are so honored you're spending time with us. To my amazing producer, Paula Martini, we are just so delighted to have this whole team together. See you next time, everyone. Did you love this episode and want to hear more? Head over to drkaliawaddles.com slash podcast where you can find more episodes on all things fertility.